My name is Anke Karolin Berger. I'm a literature translator based in Montreal, Canada and Berlin, Germany. And I've known Cecile Pineda for over 20 years now. And yes, and, uh, but in many ways, I feel I'm only getting to know her now. Now that I've read her fabulous memoir, Entry Without Inspection, A Writer's Life in El Norte. Reading this fabulous autobiography has moved me very much. And I'm very grateful today that Cecile Pineda has agreed to talk to me about her new book. Cecile, um, I recall that we met on a trip to Mexico and for obscure reasons, we found ourselves sharing a hotel room in Oaxaca City. And when I think back of this beautiful trip to Mexico, I, uh, it feels to me like a passage that you're describing here in your new book. Would you care to read that to us, please? <laughs> You know, I want to comment before I read, uh, what a wonderful way to meet a wonderful person. Uh, you know, you don't know, uh, you are the fourth, okay, of, of a quartet of people that are going to travel to Mexico. And the reason you're doing this is that they need a fourth person. They have a third person, but they need a fourth person in order to share a room. Well, that's how I met you. And oh my goodness. You know, Oaxaca anyway is a miraculous city. It just, there, there are there's so many places in Mexico that are very much what they are in terms of uh, culture, in terms of color, in terms of customs. And one of the very high points is Oaxaca not only Oaxaca, but the province of Oaxaca as well. And of course, what we didn't know when I was traveling with you is who my people were. And that's what this book is about. So I will read, as you asked me, this little tiny passage here from, uh, from uh, this memoir. And it's actually an anti-memoir because it's a memoir that deals with one of the great factors that has shaped my life even before my birth. And that was to be denied my culture and my people. So I'm gonna read this. Compared to the Protestant Sundays of my New York childhood with its gray deserted streets echoing to the funereal melancholy of the Riverside Church Korean, Mexico fairly explodes with color street side stalls brim with vegetables and fruits and native crafts. Women cram the markets, their baskets overflowing. Parents grip children by the hand, threading their way through the throngs. Youngsters dance in the street and the sounds of music vibrates everywhere. Blazing sunlight lifts the finials of colonial architecture in fine relief. Textiles and ceramics bear messages of a suppressed pre-Columbian past. Churches squat on the ruins of ancient pyramids, their sedate Baroque proportions marked by unruly indigenous signals trying to break through. But over the next four weeks, the words I manage in Spanish, a language that remains awkward for me to this day, bends my tongue, and even though my courage grows, I experience a certain psychic turmoil when I try to speak it. Thank you, Cecil. That is very beautiful. That is a beautiful passage, and I feel that there is a lot of uh, love for Oaxaca, M Mexico, in you. So why is this place so special for you? Well, you see, when we were there, I had no idea what its real significance was in terms of my life. 
But you ask me why Oaxaca is so extraordinary. And there are a thousand reasons. The sun shines more brightly in Oaxaca than anywhere else on earth. That's my feeling. Uh, these streets are not empty. People don't drive, they walk. Hmm. And the streets are full of human life and human interaction. And, and, and all, all categories of humanity are there in the streets, whether the very poor and the very, very advantaged and all in between. But Oaxaca is color. And, and <laughs> from my birth, I've had a love affair with color. And that's this <laughs> blouse that, that I'm wearing is a blouse that I bought while you and I were in Oaxaca. And if you can see it, uh, this I'm going to stand up so so you can see it properly. Uh, but this oh, rep this represents beautiful. the rep this represents the corn. Okay. Uh, see the tassels of the corn. Yeah. These are the corn motifs and the embroidery of the of the um, the the plant itself is very colored. So you see, no two are alike. And, yeah. and there's no Fabulous. symmetry here Fabulous. in terms of color. It's, it's just the hazard of the thread that the woman is using when she makes this blouse. And uh, I couldn't resist it, you know. This is Mexico to me. So, Cecil, I, from what I recall you writing in your book, your father actually, unbeknownst to you, hails from this region of Mexico, is that true? Uh, it, actually, uh, my father was born in Mexico City, mm -hmm. and he was born in 1894. Mm -hmm. And um, in my childhood, he absolutely would not convey anything about the color, what I've just spoken about, the, mm -hmm. the sunshine, the, the, the ambiance that makes Mexico what it is. Yeah. And, um, and my first impressions of what I've just told you, the color and the life and the extraordinary will to live no matter what, um, that comes to me from my godmother because she also had a love affair with Mexico. And she traveled there in the, in the 30s and she photographed a great deal of the life in the, in the streets. Uh, she photographed Indians, for example, at the market. And they had their children in boxes, okay? There, there were no play pens, of course, in yeah. Mexico. You know, you either have a nanny or you have a box that you put a child in. And so there are these little children, perfectly happy, in boxes. They're playing, you know? Uh, it's like a little boat that they're in um, <laughs> and while their parents are selling vegetables or whatever right. they're selling. Right. I oh. yeah, I... All of these people are wearing homespun and all of them are uh, either barefoot or they're wearing huaraches, uh, which as you know are recycled uh, car tires on their feet. Right, right, right. So um, you mentioned that your ancestors might actually be Sapotec. Can you talk about oh, that? Oh, absolutely. Well, you see, that's that's the that's the uh, revelation of this of this book. Uh, you know, it's funny when I start a project, I never, never know what it's going to be. And with this, it there's there's no difference. That's exactly how I started. I didn't know what I would discover, but mm. I do know that if I'm excited and discovering stuff my readers are going to be exciting, but excited because they also are on the same kind of chase as I am. And so um, I discovered where my people come from. Now I've always known that my father was Mexican, but you see that says nothing. It says nothing about class. It says nothing about ethnicity. It says nothing about all of the cultural elements that you know I've tried to talk about already. Uh, he, he refused basically to answer my questions. I had so many questions. Mm -hmm. Who was my grandmother? 
Where did she come from? I never knew. What happened to her? I never knew. So? So eventually, because I was writing this book, one day it occurred to me, I'm going to Google my grandfather. Now, see, here's the thing. My father had always told me that my grandfather was a kind of two-bit um, Mexico City lawyer. And was, he was born, you know, in 1852 or something like that. No, not earlier, actually. Um, why he would be Googleable? <laughs> that's that's a word. That's that's an adverb. Uh, why he would be Googleable is ridiculous. But nonetheless, I did look at the internet because you know everybody tells me, well, have you checked the internet? Well, no, because I was not born with an internet in my cradle. I didn't have a computer, you know, for a long time. So okay, so I checked the internet, and there he was, and I discovered he was born in Oaxaca, and this family comes from Oaxaca. You see, I had gone to San Cristobal de las Casas a long time ago, and there's a wonderful library there, uh, genealogy and so forth. And I thought, well, I'll find them there. But no, it yielded absolutely nothing about this name. This name is quintessentially from Oaxaca, Pineda. And P Pineda, you see, in Oaxaca, there are so many. We are like Smiths in Oaxaca because, um, because in 1746, a very well-meaning, pious Spanish lady uh, decided to adopt uh, 30 Zapotec children and save them from the white man's hell by baptizing them and giving them her name. And none of those 30 children were related. So there are many different clans of people that bear the name Pineda. And I come from one of them, all right? And uh, so my grandfather was born in Huchitan. Huchitan is very interesting because now you see it's known for its matriarchy. It's matrilineal. It's the only place in Mexico where women thumb their noses at men and do what they need to do. And the reason they do that is that in the 1880s or so, the railroad of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec was being built and the men left. And what were the women to do to support themselves? Well, they went into business. You know, it's the same story as the Middle Ages. Okay. The lords were away. The women learned how to run the castle. So it's the same with the women in Oaxaca. And that has stamped them from that time on. It's very a very matrilineal culture. And the women are enormous, big, big, well-endowed, generously endowed women, <laughs> you know? And then the men, the men are the tiny little men. <laughs> the other thing that Oaxaca is known for is this great toleration for people in complex sexual spectrums. So they have what they call mouche. And these are transvestites. These are people who dress as women and live as women. It's very recognized in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be excited about, you know, this is, mm. see, and that is true of all of the Indian cultures in the Western Hemisphere. Interesting. All of them were extremely accepting of all the spectrum of sexuality from beginning to end, you see. So, unfortunately, um, your father did not remain in Mexico. You were not born in this uh, spectacular place of uh, Oaxaca, but you uh, were born in New York City. So <laughs> I think if I'm correct, what happened was the Mexican Revolution. What role did that play in your family history? Well, that's kind of very interesting and complex, okay? This is not easy. Uh, my my great grandfather, I discovered because I googled him. My great grandfather, my grandfather was a um, minister, a cabinet minister of the government of Mexico. Okay. His name is on the one peso note. He signed it. You see, so he must have been at one point minister, uh, ministry of the uh, treasury, head of the ministry of treasury. 
and he served under the, the presidency of Porfirio Diaz. And Porfirio Diaz uh, came to office with great notions of democracy. Uh, he came from a group of people that were very dedicated uh, intellectually to the idea of the enlightenment. And they call themselves the, the scientific ones, los científicos. And he came with the idea that uh, because all of this coterie of people understood the rationality of life, that they would be able to create a more rational Mexico that would serve all people more equally. Okay, that was the idea. But you see what happens with power, with very small people who often uh, are elected to office, it goes to their heads. And Diaz wouldn't leave. And he became a dictator. And of right. course, as Americans now, uh, we have a little bit of experience of what that's like. It's not very nice, okay? So, um, so you see, the, here's the thing. My grandfather was Zapotec. So he had, a, first of all, a tremendous loyalty to his people. You see, that's, that's it. that is an Indian trait. That and you never tell a lie, all right? These, these are the things that Indian people live by. And so he was serving under Diaz. And more and more his ideas of liberalism and, and, and of, of equality in, in, in Mexico were challenged by this administration. And they became more and more uncomfortable for him. And eventually, uh, I think when Diaz was trying to run for the fifth time, my grandfather counseled him, please not to run. And so when uh, the revolution came in 1910, Diaz was overthrown. It became the Madero uh, government administration. Madero invited my, great, my grandfather to serve. But my grandfather had ideas of loyalty that's see that's the other thing about about mexican culture there's a, there's a sense of honor still people have a sense of honor and they have a sense of commitment and he had to his tribe to his people and to his ideas and uh and he and he was also loyal to diaz now the reason he was loyal to diaz is that diaz regardless of his faults Diaz was responsible for educating my grandfather because if Diaz hadn't intervened in the, in the city of Oaxaca, my father would have stopped his education at the age of 15 because there were no other opportunities. And Diaz purposely selected him as one of six Zapotec children to be educated by the state. So my grandfather was educated in the Oaxaca that we visited. He was educated at the Instituto de los Artes y de los Ciencias, okay? Del Estado de Oaxaca. So, Juchitan is on the Pacific side of Mexico, and Oaxaca, which we visited, is across the mountains on the Atlantic side. So, so that's the story of my grandfather's relationship to Mexican politics. As a result, his life was threatened because he had been with the Diaz government. And he understood that his life was in danger. And he understood that the life of his sons equally would be in danger because as you know, vendettas don't stop with the father. So all of them came north. Now, what's interesting is they left the women behind. Well, we can speculate about why they left the women behind. They left my grandmother behind, and I had an aunt, Berta. They left them behind. But the three sons with the father, my grandfather, came north, okay? And um, by the time that they did that, or had to do that, I should say, um, my grandfather obviously had what's known as connections because that's what po politicians developed. And so somebody, and I don't know who, must have provided papers. They had papers, but those papers were false. Now, I have hesitated to talk about this 
during the Trump administration because frankly, I was afraid. I was very much afraid because of that. So they, they came through Brownsville on the railroad through Brownsville uh, under an assumed name of Pratt and they entered this country. And uh, they came because they are, were of this class of people that were very, very advantaged compared to the average Mexican. And they were able to educate, he, my grandfather was able to educate all three sons. Two sons went to Harvard, one son went to Columbia, he got a graduate degree in, in mining engineering, he died in a mining accident. My father went to Harvard, he studied linguistics, which perhaps is why I have such a passion for linguistics and such an interest in language and what language does. And, and I knew nothing about it because these were the kinds of disciplines that were not offered to undergraduates centuries ago when I was in school, okay? So, so I went back to school to learn something, a little bit, not much, about linguistics. And fortunately I did because I discovered it is what's still known as the Warfian hypothesis. Now, the Warfian hypothesis. I would not only... believe that I wrote a paper about that. Did you? Oh, <laughs> my word. Day. Well, I mean, we're like this, right? Because <laughs> you have these awarenesses that you can share with me. I should be interviewing you because I could learn a lot from what you know. But in any case, Warf had this idea that language is the vehicle for a worldview. So for example, if you speak Hopi, okay, the clouds are living creatures, they're alive. Mm -hmm. And how do you know that? Well, because the language, the Hopi language, reflects in its syntax, the way it talks about clouds, it, it gives them the identity of living things, okay? It ascribes that identity to them. In our language, a cloud is a dead thing. You're not alive, okay? Oh, no. And you know, I, I go walking and I look at the sky and I say, well, why not? <laughs> why not? No? <laughs> well, I mean, um, in 2015, Cecil, you published uh, a nonfiction book called Apology to a Whale, Words to Mend a World. There it is. And interestingly enough, um, you devote a large section of this book to uh, linguistics and the uh, history of the Indo-European uh, languages. So you start with the Proto-Indo-European language that all our yeah, numerous uh, Indo-European languages come from. And um, you develop an interesting theory here in this book that I think uh, has gotten quite a bit of traction in the, in the last few years. Yeah, well, so, okay. Uh, I wanna go back to uh, something I said earlier. When I start a project, I never know when it's going. And why, how do I start a project when I never know? Well, it's very simple. I ask a question. And, and this is the fundamental question in this book. Um, and the question is, what is it about the Western mind that has killed everything on this planet? That is the burning issue more than any other, it's called global warming, okay? It's what's happening to this planet and to the life on it, okay? And what technological civilization has done to create that catastrophe, all right? And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passionately angry about, about this development. But I also, I have faith and my faith is that if we understood where we come from, we could stop it. There might be some hope. And so, you know, I, I read extensively the work of Maria Gambudis, 
the uh, Lithuanian uh, anthropologist. She's dead now. Uh, but Maria Gambudis published, oh my gosh, almost 50 books, I think, but very many. And, and many, many of them are painstaking uh, renditions, drawings of the grave offering she found in the excavation she did in Eastern Europe, mostly. And these were the people who she identifies as old Europe. That is to say that we could say they were the original inhabitants of Europe. Well, they probably were not the original ones, but at that epoch of prehistory, and we're talking about 8,000 BC to about 3,000 BC, they were, they were hunters and gatherers. And they lived in small, small settlements. We wouldn't even call them villages, perhaps. They were hunters, hunter and gatherers. They were also, they had begun very, very elemental agriculture. And they were egalitarian, non-hierarchical, peaceful people. There is no weaponry to be found in any of those graves. Women and men were buried equally. Homosexual people were equally respected and part of the culture. They worshiped the mother goddess, okay? And you can see, well, you, the Venus of Heidelberg, this is an emblem of the mother goddess. As well, there are other forms of the emblem of the mother goddess. And you see it was palm sized. So mm -hmm. people could hold their devotion the way they hold their cell phones today, the new <laughs> goddess. Um, but uh, uh, they were peaceful people. They were non-hierarchical and non-patriarchal. They were egalitarian. The sexes were equal. Um, and very importantly, they spoke the proto-language of that culture, which is the culture that Gambudas identifies as old Europe. And most of all, their cycle of existence consisted of birth, life, death, and rebirth. In 3000 BC, more or less, the Yanaya from the Russian steppe, what, what is now Russia, it's an area that I'm talking about is between the Caspian and the Black Sea, uh, swept into Europe. They were herders, okay? They were herders of animals, stockmen. And, um, and they came with, with their beasts. They came with their weaponry, with their warfare, with their patriarchy, with their hierarchy, with their, with their, uh, with their language. Uh, they came uh, with their view of existence, which ended in death. Okay, that's where we come from, death, okay? This is what I'm apologizing for. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm apologizing for. Mm -hmm. they, they came, their, 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 their worldview ended in death, okay? Mm -hmm. And they killed everything in their path. Within a thousand years, they had swept across Europe. They had massacred people throughout Europe. It's what's very interesting in Germany. They practiced, um, they practiced the, uh, uh, the uh, custom of burning uh, uh, their uh, of burning their widows and their servants and their slaves and their animals and burying them with them. Okay, it's called sati in India. In India, mm -hmm. uh, a devout woman was supposed to throw herself into. Excuse me, Cecil. Of her yeah. husband, and many still do, of course, and not only in India, but right here in the building in which I live. But that's another question. Okay, okay. So, let's let's just interrupt for one second. Yes. Um, the this Yamnaya culture that swept over Europe. I informed myself on Wikipedia today that they supposedly also brought the pest with them to Europe. The pest, the, the pest, the Black Death. You know. Yes, yes, I heard the, you. the plague. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was German. <laughs> no, in so, French too. In French too, la peste. So at the moment where the whole world is in the grips of a virus. So at that time, obviously this herding culture 
because they had already learned how to live with domesticated animals, they had probably already uh, developed some kind of resistance to diseases that they now brought with them to Europe and wiped out probably the original cultures that lived in oh, that's Europe not, at that time. That's, that's, not, that's not how they did it. That's not how they did it. Now, it very well may have, I mean, it, what you brought up is fascinating. It may very well be that that helped, but they, they helped it, okay? And the way they did it is they massacred people as they went. And they stopped when they got to the Atlantic coast because you could not cross the sea then. They didn't have the technology. Until 1492, when this same massacring invasion was extended into the new world. And as you know, massacred millions of indigenous people in this continent, in this- Millions. Country. All right. Now, now, what's very interesting, and your and your listeners may want to know where to look for these things. And um, after I had published this, I had this was published in 2015, as you mentioned, but I had started to work on it in 2012. And now, in 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 2019, uh, there is corroboration of this hypothesis, and uh, the the chief geneticist is a man named David Reich, who works at Harvard and who's published a book, Who We Are and Where We Come From, yes. And, uh, and the, the genetic, uh, the DNA uh, is signature to the Yamaya people in the Y chromosome, which means that they either castrated or massacred all the men and enslaved all the women to bear their children because the X chromosome still shows uh, a multiplicity of origin. Whereas the male, European males carry the Y chromosome, almost all. And as you mentioned, all of our languages are descended from Proto-Indo-European except for four, okay? And one of those four is Basque. In Basque, as you know, this is the western part of Spain, okay? They never got there. So the Basque language is very probably descended from the original language of old Europe. That's, that's my theory. That is also uh, Maria Gimbura's theory, uh, that Basque may very well be what is carrying the proto-language. Cecile, maybe we should take a tiny, tiny break and then go to our next subject, if you're ready. Would that yeah, be okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I'm all in favor. <laughs>